Welcome to Flourish. I'm Diane Panadan, and you're in the right place if you're ready to create an inspired life. And we do so by working on our own personal development so we can be strong role models for those we love and mentor. Today, I am super excited to talk about a research paper. Yes, kind of a little strange twist, kind of, sort of. I've been taking psychology at Queen's University, and I've been introduced to so many interesting historical psychologists and papers it's it's a little overwhelming but it's also super exciting once you start delving into this and making connections today i'm going to discuss a paper i briefly mentioned in my psychology 100 episode chapter 4 in the history of psychology and it's called the magical number 7 plus or minus 2 some limits of our capacity for processing information. This paper was written by George Miller in uh, at, when he was at Harvard University in 1956. And you know, he's kind of a funny guy. When you start reading these uh, between the lines, it gets quite interesting. So the paper begins with <laughs> him saying, my problem is that I have been persecuted by an integer. So, He's haunted by a number. For seven years, aha, this number has followed me around, has intruded in my most private data, and has assaulted me from the pages of our most public journals. This number assumes a variety of disguises, being sometimes a little larger and sometimes a little smaller than usual, but never changing so much as to be unrecognizable. The persistence with which this number plagues me. It's far more than a random accident. There is, to quote a famous senator, a design behind it, some patterns governing its appearance. Either there is really something unusual about the number, or else I am suffering from delusions of persecution. (laughs) How hilarious is that? He's haunted by the number seven for seven years. Yes, so his uh, research was based on the fact that uh, Bell, which is now, I believe, AT&T, wanted to devise the best numerical sequence for people to remember phone numbers, something to that effect. Uh, Do they chunk them together in little bits, such as the area code, that type of thing? Now, do you remember your phone number from childhood? In North America, there are seven digits, in fact. And yes, I remember mine from childhood. He continues his paper to go over the different experiments he conducted and the research and what he found. And the reason it's called plus or minus two is sometimes that seven resulted in a nine and sometimes in a five. But it was always in that sweet spot and, of course, the happy middle being seven in the big picture. And that is fascinating when you start thinking about it, because this was 1956, remember, but at the end of the paper, he gives a summary. So I will summarize his remarks in this paper, but it goes back much further in history. So at the end, I'll just give you a little for instance. So he ended the paper by saying it seemed probable that even memorization can be studied in these terms. The process of memorizing may be simply the formation of chunks or groups of items that go together until there are few enough chunks so that we can recall them. So that's really important in learning. So if you're learning how to learn, especially learning how to learn online, you need to to net it down, to chunk it down. And hopefully instructors can also summarize for you what you really need to know. You know, not a lot of filler in between. Not like me. I'm always filling in words on this podcast, aren't I? (laughs) So he's summarizing remarks. First, the span of absolute judgment and the span of immediate memory impose severe limitations on the amount of information that we are able to receive process, and remember. By organizing the stimulus input simultaneously into several dimensions and successively into a sequence of chunks, we manage to break or at least stretch this informational bottleneck. 
Second, the process of recoding is a very important one in human psychology and deserves much more explicit attention than it has received. In particular, the kind of linguistic recoding that people do seem to me to be the very lifeblood of the thought process. Recoding procedures are a constant concern to clinicians, social, social psychologists, linguists, and anthropologists, and yet probably because recoding is less acceptable to experimental manipulation than nonsense syllables or T mazes, the traditional experimental psychologist has contributed little or nothing to their analysis. Didn't I tell you he was funny? <laughs> Nevertheless, experimental techniques can be used, methods of recoding can be specified, behavioral in indicants can be found. And I anticipate that we will find a very orderly set of relations describing what now seems an uncharted wilderness of individual differences. Hmm, but was it? And third, the concepts and measures provided by the theory of information provide a quantitative way of getting at some of these questions. The theory provides us with a yardstick for calibrating our stimulus material and for measuring the performance of our subjects. Yes, he measured these empirically. In the interest of communication, I have suppressed the technical details of the information measurement and have tried to express the ideas in more familiar terms. I hope this paraphrase will not lead you to think they are not useful in research. Informational concepts have already proved valuable in the study of discrimination and of language. They promise a great deal in the study of learning and memory. And it has even been proposed that they can be useful in the study of concept formulation. A lot of questions that seemed fruitless 20 or 30 years ago may now be worth another look. In fact, I feel that my story here must stop just as it begins to get really interesting. Ooh, so he's like, ooh, giving us some ideas and thoughts and, you know, questioning what happened 20, 30 years ago. This is in the 50s and today. So we're like a moving target. We're constantly in flow, aren't we? And finally, what about the magical number seven? What about the seven wonders of the world? The seven seas, the seven deadly sins, the seven daughters of Atlas in the Pleiades. If you don't know that story, it's, uh, I think it's back to Greek mythology, maybe even further back, but there's seven sister stars and this squirrel are quite fascinating. I loved Greek mythology when I was growing up. He goes on to say, the seven ages of man, the seven levels of hell, the seven primary colors, the seven notes of the musical scale, and the seven days of the week. Mm -hmm. And God said, on the seventh day, you shall rest. This is getting really interesting. What about the seven point rating scale? The seven categories for absolute judgment, seven objects in the span of attention, and the seven digits in the span of immediate memory. That's the telephone number, the seven digits. For the present, I propose to withhold judgment. Perhaps there is something deep and profound behind all these sevens, something just calling out for us to discover it. But I suspect that it is only uh, pernicious, which means harmful. So I suspect that it's only a pernicious Pythagorean coincidence. <laughs> so in Pythagorean num numerology, the number seven means spirituality. So he suspects it's almost a harmful spiritual coincidence. What do you think of that? Yeah, fascinating. So the way I remember things, and I'll remember Miller, and I'll remember this paper, is to make a connection. So out of all those sevens that he gave us to think about, I'll think of the seven sister stars of the Pleiades, because I love Greek mythology. So what will you think about? Will you think of a movie, maybe mm, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, Seven Year Itch, The Magnificent Seven? Maybe you love to read. A lot of uh, motivational books revolve around the number seven. 
one of my favorites growing up as a kid was the seven Chinese brothers. The seven spiritual laws of success by Deepak Chopra. And what about the seven habits of highly effective people? So look for how you can connect maybe so you can help yourself remember these things because these scientific papers, ooh, they can be a little overwhelming. <laughs> I'm just going to say that out loud. So I have to find the simplicity. What works for you? Where can you find some simplicity in remembering the number seven so you can remember this theory and remember the paper or remember what you need to remember? because you deserve this. You deserve to succeed. You deserve to have the knowledge that all these other scientists and brilliant minds have because you too have a brilliant mind and you deserve to live a more inspired life. And if you like the show, share it with someone you know and give us a thumbs up. Maybe add a comment. Maybe help others learn by putting in the comments some tricks that work for you. We all one big community. And I'd love it if you could hit that subscribe button and go on to live a more inspired life.